Hello everybody. Today I'm going to talk with you briefly about cognitive development during the toddler years. We're going to focus this lecture on Piaget's theories of the first stage of cognitive development in his mind, which is sensory motor intelligence. So to Piaget, sensory motor intelligence is the term for the way that infants think. They use their senses and their motor skills. So in other words, there's not a lot of reasoning going on. It's a very direct way of experiencing the world that influences how we develop in our early years. To Piaget, infants are very active learners, and the most important part about uh, learning about the world is learning how to adapt their pre-existing thoughts about things as they gain new experience. And to Piaget, cognition is going to develop in these four distinct periods, of which sensory motor intelligence is the first. Two important concepts I'd like you to be familiar with are assimilation and accommodation. These are two of Piaget's most important ideas because to him, this is how learning happens. So adaptation to new information is the process that we are looking at in both of these examples. So assimilation is the kind of adaptation where new experiences are interpreted in such a way that they fit into or assimilate with old ideas. Accommodation, on the other hand, is a different kind of adaptation where the developing infant finds that the old ideas aren't sufficient. They need to actually restructure what they used to think in order to accommodate these new experiences. Now, both of these concepts should be familiar as we covered them in our earlier section on theories. A new idea for all of you that's brought up in this chapter is the idea of circular reactions, which is really important in sensory motor theory. So to Piaget, there are three kinds of circular reactions. There's the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary. And what I want you to understand about this is that a circular reaction is simply that an action that produces pleasure or curiosity or engagement then encourages more action. So that the circle means that a little bit of involvement in the sensation of something is going to lead to further exploration, which then leads to a continuation of the behavior. So primary circular reactions, an example would be thumb sucking. Um, the baby, maybe accidentally, the thumb moves to the mouth. Then as the baby who has a, a sucking reflex sucks on the thumb, that feels good. And the circular reaction, what feels good, you keep doing it. And so the behavior continues. In secondary circular reactions, there's an object involved. So it's not sufficient to just have a thumb to suck on. In this case, consider maybe giving a baby a rattle. Perhaps accidentally, the object is shaken and it makes an interesting sound. The baby then figures out how to move the muscles of her hands or legs in order to create that sound, thus perpetuating that circular action. Um, people who have spent a lot of time with babies and toddlers will tell you that everything is about repetition. It's as though these circular behaviors just occur over and over and over again. And that's how babies learn to refine their motor movements. That's how they get more skilled at using their bodies and using their hands and their eyes and getting used to the sensations in their environment. So the repetition that is a part of these circular reactions is the critical feature. Now, as the baby grows into toddlerhood, we then become interested in what we call tertiary circular reactions, which is where the baby does an action, sees what happens, and then is able to generate a novel action, and they want to see what happens. And that sort of exploration also adds to cognitive development. So in sensory motor intelligence at stages one and two in Piaget's theory, we have these primary circular reactions where sensation, perception, and cognition all interact. As the baby um, grows a bit, these primary circular reactions um, build on reflexes until pretty soon the baby's learning how to manipulate objects in very, very simple ways. 
So infants begin interacting with the world through these rather hardwired reflexes, things that are kind of built into our biology to create certain behaviors. So one of the reflexes you might consider is um, sucking. That reflex is there because it encourages the infant to feed. And so when the infant cannot feed on a bottle or a breast, you may find that the infant is putting things in his or her mouth. And that's a way of getting the sensory input that the reflexes demand. So adaptation begins as soon as the infant realizes can't like feed all the time, but there's other ways that I can get this need met. As we move into stages three and four of the sensory motor intelligence period, we are now into these secondary circular reactions, which you might recall involve something other than just the baby's uh, body. It might involve an object, or it could even involve something like a peekaboo game, which is where in stage three, at about age four to eight months, you'll see the baby spending more and more time engaging in interesting things, and they like the repetition. So maybe when a uh, caregiver or an adult makes a funny sound, the baby will look intensely at the adult's face and laugh and giggle. In stage four, which is at about age six to 12 months, um, we now have anticipation of what the adult might do. And one of the best ways to understand anticipation is to consider the game of peekaboo. So early on, um, like at about uh, six to nine months is when babies enjoy getting one of their rules kind of messed with. And what I mean by this is at about nine months, Babies are beginning to understand what Piaget called object permanence, which basically means that objects continue to exist even when you can't see them. Interestingly enough, prior to the age of nine months, to an infant, if someone or something is not visible to them in their environment, is not readily in their range of perception, in a sense, they assume they're gone. So object permanence, the idea that maybe things are not readily visible to you, maybe you can't see your mom, but she actually is still there, that's this idea of object permanence. Peekaboo is a way of playing with object permanence because basically the adult usually holds up two hands in front of her face, hides her face from the baby, and then removes those hands to look at the baby. What has just happened? The baby experiences a momentary emotional loss. Oh no, mom's gone. The hands go away and the peekaboo comes back. Mom is there. The baby often responds with laughter. It's a delightful thing to realize that your favorite objects or your favorite people continue to exist even if you can't see them. So while this is happening in the period of about nine to 12 months, we also see that infants begin to generate spontaneous goal-directed behavior. What this means is they start to recognize that they can have actions with purpose, that they can uh, use their motor skills to get things that they want, that they can um, use their motor skills to get objects to do what they want. So if you think about early play with toys, some of the earliest things we see infants do is working with cause and effect toys because they um, now have a goal. If I press this button, Elmo's gonna pop up and make a sound and they will refine those motor movements through lots and lots of practice to get that goal to be realized. At stages five and six of the sensory intelligence period, which basically stage five is about 12 to 18 months, stage six about 18 to 24 months, this is where we get into that active experimentation phase, which Piaget calls tertiary circular reactions. This is where the developing child is drawn to a whole range of new activities and lots of variations in the way that they play. They begin to do what's called means end play. In other words, if I do these things with this objects, with these objects, there will be a result. That's the end. So you begin to see play such as building towers uh, with blocks, or you'll see various uh, combinations of play behaviors where um, developing babies will begin to say, feed a doll with a spoon or demonstrate some um, imitation of actions they've seen in the real world and even some beginning imaginary play. 
It's also important to keep in mind that during the sensory motor period, memory grows substantially. So in the first few weeks of life, um, the infant will recognize caregivers by their face, their voice, and by how they smell. And this continues across the lifespan with increasing attention usually being given to audio and visual cues and a little bit less conscious energy given towards smell as we get older. At about three months, infants can actually retain memories of how to move muscles to um, get certain motor movements to happen. Prior to three months, those motor movements tend to be accidental and random. At around nine months, the infant now has more complex memories, can begin to remember where certain things are, or even begin to remember certain routines or uh, play activities that are done with familiar people. Implicit and explicit memory are two different kinds of memory that develop over time. Implicit memory um, has to do with those things that are directly related to our own experience. They are things that we aren't necessarily conscious of remembering, but we remember them, such as remembering a caregiver's face. And those sorts of um, unconscious rememberings are stable by about nine months. Explicit memory, think of it as something that is new in your experience and you want to try to recall it later. You're sort of um, going out of your way to uh, consciously remember something does take longer to emerge and is more associated with the advent of goal-directed behaviors. Now early on, things that are remembered are usually strong in affect. So strong emotion leads to a better memory, stra memory trace. Another thing that helps us remember things, especially when we're young, is repetition and reminders. So attention to certain cues in the environment that are often associated with a particular behavior or a particular skill um, will definitely help uh, with memory. Memory is actually um, a neurological function and it involves changes in how different brain cells are connected up. So there are individual differences in how well built our nervous systems are to remember things, but in general, most human beings with healthy brains go through a developmental process uh, where memory is improving across infancy so that by about 9 to 12 months of age, the building blocks for implicit and explicit memory are there. By about 12 months, infants can actually remember uh, some patterns and uh, particular experiences that they associate with certain toys or people. Infant memory research has gained a, a lot of attention recently, and um, people have discovered that infants are actually uh, better at remembering than we ever thought. So one of the more famous examples is Rove Collier's experience, where um, they use different complex mobiles, um, things that they hang above the baby's crib, and they have to be activated in a certain way. The baby has to remember what actions to do to make the mobile move and once it moves it gives them pleasure which is thought to reinforce the action. In this sort of a paradigm what infants show is that they can learn how to use a specific action for a specific mobile but they do not yet have the cognitive capacity to do what we call generalization. In other words to take that same skill that they learned with a specific mobile and now bring it to a different mobile. So infants are not yet able to generalize or transfer or carry skills from one object to another. So infants will continue to experiment as they pull together their senses and their motor movements. So in conclusion, we um, really did learn a lot from Piaget in his theory of stages of development. The way that he talks about infant development and sensory motor functioning, how motor skills and sensation come together through repetition as the child explores the world, gaining pleasure from that exploration and thus extending that exploration. All of those things have turned out to be uh, true in current science. One of the advances that we've had since Piaget's time 
is we've actually discovered that most infants are capable of far more than Piaget ever imagined. In fact, there's a very interesting book, if you like this uh, area, called The Scientist in the Crib by Dr. Gopnik, Alison Gopnik, G-O-P-N-I-K. And in The Scientist in the Crib, Dr. Gopnik talks about all of the different ways that developing infants explore their world and learn about what's going on around them. And her models and her research suggests that there's more going on than Piaget ever imagined. So thank you for your time and attention. And I now uh, hope that you will check out lecture two in this chapter.